immunotherapies that we have today in the clinic, not just for pancreas cancer, but for all other cancers, and then segue into why we think immunotherapy can be used for pancreas cancer, and then finally finish with what are some of the current ways that we are attempting to make pancreas cancer more immunotherapy susceptible. So these are some funding disclosures. We have some research funding from Bristol Myers, but we won't be really talking about anything that is relevant in, this, uh, in the talk today. So unfortunately, this slide maybe is not projecting as well because of the lights, but I think it's fair to say that we are now squarely in the realm of immunotherapy in cancer treatment. We now know that we can treat advanced cancer patients who have otherwise failed conventional therapies, surgery, chemotherapy, targeted therapy, and in a subset of these patients, even affect cure. And this is an example of one such patient. So this is a patient with metastatic melanoma. You can see on the picture on your left, multiple satellite metastases in the upper portion of her thigh, and you're only seeing her thigh, but she had metastases essentially throughout her, her whole body and had failed all conventional treatments. I'll point your attention to the timestamp there. That's November 2006. She received a single dose of anti-CTR4 blocking antibody ipilimumab. And notice the follow-up timestamp to your right. This is six weeks later. She had complete regression of all lesions, and you can see the picture of the residual melanin deposits in the upper portion of her thigh. So that was January of 2007, and I can tell you 12 years ongoing, she's free of disease and essentially cured. So immunotherapy is, is powerful. Why? Well, because you can go from what's on the left of your screen to what's on the right of your screen, and there's very few, if any, potentially therapies that can really achieve this. It's specific. What do we mean by this? Well, it has the ability to selectively target cancer cells, thereby sparing normal tissues. This is contrary to some of the other therapies that we have today, surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation, which also affect normal tissues. It has the potential property of memory. So this allows for the possibility of providing patients with a limited number of doses and then stopping treatment. Unlike, for instance, the conventional therapies where in order to have a continued anti-cancer effect, you have to have continuous dosing of the treatment. And finally, immunotherapy is universal. You could use the same therapy to treat a multitude of cancer types. So how do we get from what's on the left of your screen to what's on the right of your screen. And this has been the subject of investigations in multiple laboratories throughout the world for the past several decades. And what we have learned is that the fundamental interaction to harnessing the power of the most successful immunotherapies has to do with the ability of T cells to be able to recognize specialized proteins that are found in cancer cells. And this ability of T cells to recognize cancer antigens really underlies the success of the most successful immunotherapies that we have today. We've also learned that this interaction of T cell recognizing cancer antigens have multiple points of regulation. And by understanding these multiple points of regulation, we've also now understood how we can use and harness these points of regulation in the form of various different therapies. So we now know that if T cell recognizing an antigen, so the picture of the, the yellow receptor there is the T cell receptor, if that's, for instance, the ignition of your car, there are several other steps that you need to be able to activate the T cell fully. And the accelerator, if you will, is an interaction between a second molecule, the B7 family of molecules with the CD28 family of molecules on the T cell itself. And there are also additional ways, for instance, you have breaks, such as the PDL1, PD1 interaction. So you have ways to be able to turn the T cell on when you recognize the antigen, and you also have ways to be able to slow the T cell down with the breaks. And 
the ability this and this understanding of what controls or regulates T cell recognition really led to the development of blocking antibodies to the checkpoint blockade pathway therapies such as blocking PDL1 which is on the on this side or blocking PD1 which is on the other side the T cell side so one thing I would highlight is that all of the current successful immunotherapies that are in the clinic today, what they do is they boost pre-existing responses that are found in the patient already. So we haven't really been able to uh, successfully uh, initiate new immune uh, uh, recognition, but they really boost existing recognition. So the first question if you are asking, well, can we use immunotherapies for pancreas cancer is, well, is there immune recognition in pancreas cancer? And is, is that perhaps why the current immunotherapies are failing because there is no immune recognition? And we believe that there is immune recognition in pancreas cancer. This is a study that was published in 2013. This was a, a, one of the largest immunohistochemistry analyses of resected pancreatic cancer patients. And essentially looking at whether or not you have immune cells in primary pancreatic tumors. And if you have more immune cells in the tumor, do you do better or worse? So very simple question, but very uh, elegant answer. You'll see here that tumors that had higher numbers of CD4 T cells, that's the graph on your left, or higher number of CD8 T cells, that's the graph on your right, Patients who had higher numbers of these cells in the tumor, they did better. And this is the pink survival curves. So suggesting that there is perhaps an early signal of T cell recognition of pancreas cancers. Now, but what are the specific targets that they are recognizing? And this has remained an unanswered question. And um, as we learned more about the successful application of checkpoint blockade immunotherapies in the clinic, we have now learned that one of the most potent targets for immune cells, for T cells, uh, in tumors is their ability to recognize mutations, which are found in the tumor, but are not found in the normal tissues. And these mutations that can be recognized by T cells are called neoantigens. And this is to be distinguished between other antigens which are found in the cancer cell but are not found in normal tissues, but they are present there as a consequence of maybe differential expression, but it's not because that there's an actual mutation. We now know that neoantigens are very important, or at least one very important class of targets that are recognized by T cells, because if you have more neoantigens in tumors, you tend to have a better response to the checkpoint blockade immunotherapies. And this has now been shown in various cancer types, most, uh, uh, mostly in, in uh, melanoma and in lung cancer. So, the first, so with respect to pancreas cancer, then the question arises, well, are there neoantigens in pancreas cancer? And um, is there T cell recognition of neoantigens in pancreas cancer? So, um, so the initial studies, um, the earlier sequencing studies of pancreas cancer, uh, this was done prior to the advent of more updated next generation sequencing technology, identified a mutational burden in pancreas cancer that was on the order of around one mutation per megabase. So that's the left red box there. And that predicted that neoantigens were probably unlikely to be seen in pancreas cancer. However, more recent next generation sequencing has suggested that neoantigen formation is much more common. And so this raises the question, perhaps neoantigens could be immune targets for T cells in pancreas cancer. So this was a question that we uh, looked at in the laboratory. And this here is, these are survival curves of all patients with pancreas cancer treated with surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation. And what we hypothesized was building on the work that I had shown you earlier, that there, if you have more immune cells in cancers, patients tend to do better. We identified the rare subpopulation of patients who do not die from pancreas cancer. These are the 7% that you can see here where the curve flattens out. And what we, when we looked at these patients closely, these are the long-term survivors of pancreas cancer. 
And what we found was that their exceptional survival couldn't really be explained by different treatment or earlier stage. 40% of them have evidence of tumor in the lymph nodes. Nearly a quarter of them have positive surgical margins, so technically tumor left behind in the patient. But these patients survived, and many of them are essentially cured from pancreas cancer. And we thought perhaps these were the patients who had more T cells in their tumors, and perhaps the T cells were recognizing neoantigens. So this was what we started off by hypothesizing, and we, to answer this, what we did was we identified two cohorts of patients who were stage and treatment matched long and short-term pancreatic cancer survivors. These were all primary resected patients. And then we did a multitude of, of uh, uh, sequencing, uh, immunohistochemistry, transcriptomic pro profiling, and other T cell receptor profiling techniques to be able to see what is really happening in these hot tumors of these long-term survivors. And what we found, and this was really building on what other groups had shown previously, was that these tumors of long-term survivors are really enriched in immune cells. And they are specifically enriched in T cells. And if you look, so if you just look at the graph on your right here, they have about 12-fold higher activated T cells, CDA T cells in their tumors compared to patients who didn't survive uh, as long. And when we went a little bit further to see what these T cells might be actually responding to, what we found was that uh, the T cells, we think, or at least a subclass of these T cells are responding to mutations that are found in the patient's tumors. And these mutations, we could identify a priori, meaning even prior to, um, uh, based upon their primary tumors, based upon sequencing techniques, we could identify them using computational strategies. This is what we call as a what we call the quality model here. So if you see here that patients who have these high quality neoantigens in their tumors tended to do much better compared to patients who had low quality neoantigens, but the similar when you just looked at neoantigen based upon a, a binary stratification of number, the quantity high versus quantity low, these patients did not actually stratify these patients by survival. So we, we showed this in a couple of different cohorts. This was a cohort out of Sloan Kettering. We also showed this in one of the larger cohorts from the ICGC, the International Cancer Genome Consortium, one of the largest pancreatic cancer sequencing efforts to date. Uh, and so, so we think that at least in a subset of pancreatic cancers, there are there is certainly immune recognition of neoantigens. And we think from a therapeutic standpoint, this can be harnessed in the form of more antigen delivery, sort of going back to harnessing this interaction between T cells and antigens. And more antigen delivery is the principle behind cancer vaccination. And cancer vaccination for pancreas cancer is not new. Um, it has actually been pioneered, pioneering work done by the group out of Hopkins from Liz Jaffe's group who have uh, shown this not with neoantigens but with shared antigens this is a study, if this will go forward, uh, showing uh, vaccination against a shared antigen, uh, not a neoantigen in pancreas cancer, potentially could be safe and effective in pancreatic cancer. So now with our understanding that neoantigens may be even more effective at stimulating the immune response, there are current ongoing efforts by our group at Memorial, as well as multiple other groups, including at Hopkins, to be able to deliver neoantigens using personalized techniques uh, in, in, in the setting of clinical trials. So this is one such study um, design where patients are treated with surgery, and after surgery, they have their neoantigens identified based upon sequencing of their tumors, and then this is delivered to the patient in the adjuvant setting, either by itself or in combination with other immunotherapies and standard chemotherapies. So this is one strategy of giving more antigen. There's also other strategies to be able to harness this power, this interaction between T cells and antigen recognition. And some of these other signals we now are, know come from dendritic cells. These are also cells which can activate the T cell and enhance their ability to recognize antigens in the tumor cells. And uh, conversely, you also have other cells that can inhibit this interaction, so basically block the T cells. Um, and there are now strategies to be able to both 
um, activate the dendritic cells as well as inhibit these other bad suppressive cells which are found in the microenvironment. And I'll touch very briefly on some of the work that has been done in this field. So with respect to activating the dendritic cells, the most um, uh, developed story comes from Bob von der Heide's group where they've essentially shown that CD40 is a very important molecule that can be targeted on the dendritic cells. It basically allows for boosting recognition in tumors where there is not as much recognition at baseline. And they've done a series of very uh, beautiful studies on this looking, showing that CD40 by itself uh, in mouse models can uh, shrink the tumors and that CD40 can also be combined with chemotherapy in both patients as well as in mice to be able to, uh, to boost T cell recognition of these tumors, which perhaps may not have much recognition going on at baseline. And this was a study that uh, Dr. O'Reilly alluded to, which is now in clinical trials, uh, where uh, the phase 1b uh, results were just uh, reported at the AACR. Uh, this was a metastatic pancreatic cancer cohort that is being treated with chemotherapy and CD40 with or without checkpoint blockade inhibition. And the dose, the dose selection for the phase one study is complete and now the randomized phase two is recruiting, so we'll see what happens with this. And uh, very briefly, I'll tell you that uh, with respect to inhibiting the bad uh, players within the microenvironment, there's a slew of different ways to be able to do this. This here is a table listing various different strategies to be able to inhibit the, the immunosuppressive cells with the microenvironment. And most of the current immunotherapy clinical trials are combining this with other ways to be able to activate the T cell, most commonly with PD-1 or PD-L1 uh, blockade. So in conclusion, we think that T cells do recognize human pancreas cancer. There's probably a range in this in that there are some tumors where there is more recognition and some tumors there is less. So you may require different types of immune therapies for different types of pancreas cancers. Um, the current immunotherapies boost T cell tumor recognition. So we think harnessing this principle is probably a good way to move forward. There is currently multiple single and combination strategies to harness T-cell tumor recognition, which I highlighted. And uh, we think they are among the most promising therapeutic strategies for pancreas cancer, as highlighted by the initial slide I showed you uh, and the story in melanoma, where melanoma, in, in, at, you know, 10 years ago, patients who had metastatic melanoma like that were really, didn't really have much options and was much like pancreas cancer. And that's really been completely transformed right now. So we're hoping that immunotherapy can do the same for pancreas cancer. And thank you. Okay, I think we have time for one or two questions, and then I think we'll let people come in and have their lunch. Yes. So please. You know, that's a wonderful review. What you didn't have time to get to, which I always thought was fascinating about your study, is that the neoantigens basically share epitopes with some ancient enemies of humans, vis a vis like yellow fever. Yes. Yeah, so um, two points to address with that. So we do think the principles of recognition that we described is probably not pancreas cancer specific and it is pan cancer. Uh, we have some evidence to support that. We, when we look at the same quality model and we look at other cancer types, so we've looked at melanoma and lung cancer and now in the immunotherapy treated setting, not in the endogenous setting like we did in pancreas cancer, it is similarly able to predict survival. So the signal still is there. And recently another group, not our group, used the same algorithm that we published and looked in glioblastoma. 
and, and they were able to similarly show that it was able to predict survival in glioblastoma. So we think it probably captures something underlying about how cancers are recognized by T cells. And with respect to the second question, we don't think it is prior exposure that actually determines this uh, association. We actually think it just probably is saying something more about what is considered self and non-self by in tumors and how that's been recognized by T cells. Tumor in relation to the leukemic tumor. Yeah, so, so there's been a lot of uh, recent activity in the CAR T cell field uh, with respect to solid tumors. I would say that the bottom line is that the success that CAR T has had in liquid tumors has not yet panned out in solid tumors. There's still a lot of activity and investigation in that field. Specifically for pancreas cancer, there has been CAR-T approaches trying to target mesothelin, which is expressed in pancreas cancers, as well as CAR-T to be able, uh, mesothelin-specific CAR-Ts in mesothelioma as well. So um, I would say we are still in the investigational development phase in clinical trials, but the signals have not yet borne out any positive results. So we'll, we'll have to keep uh, keep a close eye on that. Some of the, the challenges there is because some of these antigens, um, uh, the expression of these antigens is variable. Uh, and so there's a lot of heterogeneity within these tumors. So how that potent, is that one of the reasons why the CAR Ts have not been so successful in solid tumors compared to, for instance, liquid tumors where all of the malignancies express CD19. So one potential reason why there's been uh, it hasn't had as much success yet in solid tumors. Uh, 